Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the weekend edition of Bible Discovery TV. I'm Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this program takes you, brings you up to date with what we've studied in the past week. Corey is here to help us understand it. Corey and Ryan. Corey? Thanks. Yeah, so today we're going to be taking a look at uh, what we've read all week. We're going back to Nehemiah chapter 5, and we're going to Job chapter 7. So a lot of uh, books to go over here, but it's going to be a good one. Job chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Call out now. Is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? For wrath kills a foolish man, and envy slays a simple one. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his dwelling place. His sons are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate, and there is no deliverer. Because the hungry eat up his harvest, taking it even from the thorns, and a snare snatches their substance. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring from the ground. Yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. But as for me, I would seek God, and to God I would commit my cause, who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. Job chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. What's very interesting to me is it always seems better to just be quiet. Uh, somehow that doesn't sound right, does it? Especially today. It's hard for us to shut up when we hear of someone troubled with terrible sickness or tragedy in life. We often try to find some reason that it happened. This is why, that's why. But truthfully, we don't really know what's been happening behind the scenes in the person's life. We don't see the spiritual world that they're wrapped in clearly. And we can't know all of the factors of their life. Job's three friends came to comfort him and show him sympathy according to Job chapter two, verse 11. But when they arrived, the shock of the situation made them sit silently with Job for seven days. Eliphaz, the Timonite, is the first one to speak after Job breaks the silence. He demonstrates what not to do. He speaks about all that he has learned of God, applied the wrong way and to the wrong circumstances. However, this knowledge brings pain rather than healing. His knowledge became foolish when he spoke of things out of turn. And so many times we do that, beloved. We are ready to give our advice. We're ready to give our answer. But the truth is, we don't really have the answers. And we really don't have the advice. Many times we must just simply listen to what people are saying because we don't understand everything going on around them. Now, I know there's people who've said things like, you know, well, uh, you know, God told me this or God told me. Let me tell you something. God has already spoken through his word. This is what God spoke to us. Yes, the Lord speaks today, but he speaks through his prophets who reinforce his word. Very important to hear that. So we're not off on some tangent giving tales to people about what they do. We need to understand that God is interested in our best. He's not interested in you know, us doing this or that. He's interested in us doing what's best for him, his will of God. Get your Bible guided. If you don't have your Bible guide, let me just say that it's important that uh, you can get yours. And I, and I would like to say thank you to all the people who have, uh, who have given during this very dark time in the world history. And uh, I thank you so much for being sensitive to the fact that uh, we too uh, are people who are uh, involved in this. And just, just thank you so much for being a part of that. Today, we're going to look at the silent man is right. <laughs> The silent man is right from Job chapter five. Let's pray. Father, I pray today by the power of Jesus Christ. And I pray in your name, Jesus Christ, 
that you would show us your ways and teach us your paths. We need to hear from you. This is not the time to have answers. This is the time to repent. And this is the time to come back to God. In the midst of all of this, we pray in Jesus' name that you will help us to see what you're doing and understand what's happening. In Jesus' name, and we all said together, amen. Now listen to this passage because this is important. We're going to Job chapter five, verse one. Listen to these four verses. Call out now, is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? For wrath kills a foolish man and envy slays a simple one, he says. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his dwelling place. His sons are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate and there is no deliverer. Now this, this gets really interesting because Eliphaz claims that Job has somehow violated God. Job has not violated God. You see, when someone is in trouble, we must be careful not to assume anything. Beloved, listen to me carefully. When someone is in trouble, we always make this assumption, they've done something wrong. When that's not the assumption, there is a culture of sin, a culture of rebellion against God. And that rebellion against God has a person behind it, Satan, a fallen angel, not God, a fallen angel. And he moves on us. But the Bible tells us throughout the word of the stories where God miraculously, miraculously protected Israel and people, God's people, from unseemable destruction. But let me tell you something. There are other times when God allows things to happen. And we have just witnessed all of this taking place in today's world. You see, the Lord knows what he's doing. Now let's read on and learn more. It says, because of the hungry, or because the hungry eats up his harvest, taking it even from the thorns and the snare sa snatches their substance. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring from the ground. Listen here. Affliction does not come from the dust, nor troubles spring from the ground. Verse seven, yet man is born to trouble as sparks fly upwards. <laughs> I think this is fascinating. Eliphaz tells Job that he was not careful. So trouble followed him. You see, stop that, Job. You're not careful. Trouble followed you. Now listen closely. We must never let our assumptions take us to un fair conclusions. Uh, let me explain this to you because it's important. We've learned this from God's word. God explains it to us. We can see this in the Bible. It is unfair for us to make assumptions about people, no matter what they're going through. And there is good and bad that happens to everybody. We know that from the scripture. It rains on the just. It rains on the unjust. We understand that. Because we live in a world that is ravaged by sin. And the only way we have hope in this world is to come to God through Jesus Christ and say, Jesus Christ, I believe you were God who came on the earth and lived 2,000 years ago the perfect life. You were born of a virgin and lived the perfect life. And then we crucified you and you rose from the dead. No one helped you. And so, Lord, you appeared to us in the physical flesh. And you said to us, tell everybody about what I've done. And so, Lord, today we're telling everybody about what you're doing. You can have Jesus Christ in your heart. You can have the Lord come in. You can change the way things are. But beloved, there is sin in this world and the sin ravages us and, and destroys us and, and other people. And, and it's a difficult, you see, we're not on a a cruise ship. Everybody thinks we're on a cruise ship. Well, let me tell you something. They're not that safe, but we're on a battleship, beloved. Man your stations. We're on a battleship, beloved. Man your stations. Because we are in a struggle until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and judges the nations according to Revelation chapter 19. Now let's learn more. 
Here we go with chapter five, verse eight and nine says, but as for me, I would seek God and to God, I would commit my cause who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. You see, here's what I want to say. Eliphaz assumes, there's that assumption again. Eliphaz assumes that Job is ignorant of God. You're ignorant of God, Job. No, he's not. He's not ignorant of God. You see, beloved, do not assume that someone does not have a relationship with God. I think that uh, a lot of people have sort of judged and they've said, well, that person, yeah, I, I see how he talks. I see how he walks. I see what he wears. He doesn't have a relationship with God. Stop it. Stop it. You have a relationship with God when you come to the Lord in your heart and you speak out with your mouth and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I can't do anything about it, but you did everything about it. Help me. And in the name of Jesus Christ, be Lord of my life. Doesn't matter what you wear. Doesn't matter what you speak like. Doesn't matter. It matters what you do in your heart. If you say that out loud, then God will change you. And so let's pray that right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray and pray after me now. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. I believe that you came to the cross and died. We killed you. And you rose again. And suddenly you gave us the gift of eternal life and paid the cost of sin. Forgive me of my sin. I need you in my life today. In the name of Jesus Christ. And we all said together, amen. the weekend edition of this program and we're going to update from of course Nehemiah and this is very interesting Corey because you're going to immediately start off and get us caught up on the things we have been studying this week so what is it Corey? Sure it'd be my pleasure so we're going to go back to Nehemiah chapter 5 and we're going to go chapter by chapter and get us caught up to where we are today in our Bible discovery guide. Uh, so let's just jump right in. We're going to start in Nehemiah chapter five. Now remember, Nehemiah has come back to uh, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So in Nehemiah chapter five, uh, Nehemiah is having to deal with uh, some of the poverty issues that are affecting uh, Judah. So he he has to make the, the nobles actually give an oath in front of the priests in Jerusalem uh, to lend without interest because uh, what had happened is the exiles had returned and they had come from essentially being exiles, being in debt, and they came back and they're having to reestablish their households and it, it, it's tough going. Uh, and so they were having to, to lend from some of the more well-to-do people of the land in order to do this. And Nehemiah didn't want this to end up being, you know, coming from exile into slavery. Uh, so he he deals with poverty in Nehemiah chapter 5. In Nehemiah chapter 6, we learned that the wall of Jerusalem had been built. But at this point in this chapter, the gates had not been installed. So the gate uh, chambers were there, but the doors were not on Jerusalem. And at this point, uh, we're giving the names of three of the adversaries of the Judeans, uh, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. And they charge Nehemiah, they accuse him. They say, you are planning to revolt. That's why you rebuilt the walls of the city. You want to become the Judeans next king. And that's why you're rebuilding. Uh, and of course it's not true. And uh, they, the Judeans and Nehemiah have to deal with this opposition and get the wall up as fast as they can. And this is where we learn that the wall actually gets put up in 52 days. So that is quite a feat, building an entire city wall uh, in 52 days. 
chapter seven, we get a list of returned exiles. And at this point, we're told that they put the doors into the gates. So that would have been really exciting. In chapter eight, uh, we see Ezra, who's called the teacher of the law. He's called to read the law to a gathering of the people. And he gets 13 Levites to come stand among the people as he's reading it and help them to understand it. They help the people learn from it. And then they all collectively celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles or booths. So a, a celebration here. In chapter nine, the celebration goes a little bit sad and they, they go into this time of mourning and repentance uh, and a covenant renewal that's actually sealed with the signet seals of a bunch of leaders. And uh, in the next chapter, all of those leaders who sealed the document are uh, recorded and the covenant that they signed is actually outlined. Nehemiah chapter 11 talks about people who actually came to Jerusalem to live, but they they had to be forced essentially to come to Jerusalem. No one really wanted to uproot where they were to come and live in a desolate city, uh, but they were chosen by lot. Uh, so probably by, perhaps by Urim and Thummim to come and live in Jerusalem. Chapter 12 of Nehemiah, uh, we see uh, the, there's a list of priests and Levites and a dedication of the wall. Chapter 13, there's all these little final issues that Nehemiah has to wrap up. You know, there's a priest named Eliashib who's morally compromised. Uh, the the Levites and the musicians had had to go back instead of being able to work in the Jerusalem temple, no one was tithing. They didn't have anything to live on. So they actually had to go back to their family allotments and work on their farms and in their vineyards. Nehemiah put a stop to that. He, he uh, enforced the tithe so that the temple could run. Uh, also, Nehemiah closes the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath because people were, were just too tempted uh, to enjoy commerce on that day. And Nehemiah did not want that to, uh, to happen. One of and the things, he, Corey, I just wanted to mention that one of the yeah. things that's important is Nehemiah is a, a regular guy and uh, he's not, you know, like a priest or anything like that, but he's the one who is enforcing the law of God. And I find that absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating. Close mm -hmm. your doors on the Sabbath, mm -hmm. you know, and make the Sabbath day the day that that we all just back off and, and do that. And I mm -hmm. find that fascinating. Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, and you know, Nehemiah, as, as, as a man who worked closely with kings, with pagan kings, he knew a little bit of something about authority. And he also knew from learning from Ezra, the teacher of the law, that God was supposed to be the king of, of Israel. He was supposed to be the king of Jerusalem. So God's law was to be enforced. And so Nehemiah, knowing that about authority through personal experience and, and, and knowing what God wanted of his covenant people was very passionate about enforcing that. And we read about that in the last few chapters of Nehemiah. So that really wraps up Nehemiah for us. And then, of course, we also looked at the book of Esther this week. So Esther is a really interesting, compact story. In chapter one, uh, Queen Vashti of Xerxes loses her spot as queen. In chapter two, Esther gets that spot. She nabs it. She wins the beauty pageant, essentially, and wins it. In chapter three, we learn again about Haman's plot against the Jews. And in chapter four, three, through six, we learn about Mordecai and Esther figuring out how they can ask favors of the king in order to turn this plot around. They don't want the Jewish people to be exterminated, and so they have to figure out a way for that to happen. In chapter seven, Haman, this enemy of the Jews, is killed. Uh, in chapter eight, the Jews are able to defend themselves. And in chapter nine, uh, the festival of Purim, which is still celebrated today, is established. And in chapter 10, Mordecai, uh, Esther's uncle, is promoted to second in the kingdom. So that encapsulates the entire story of Esther. And now, now, of course, we are studying through the book of Job. And we're going to cover the first seven chapters to get us right caught up to this point today. So if you've fallen behind... We're going to get you caught up. So here we go. In Job chapter one, we've got the introduction to Job. It's wisdom literature. So there's a lot of poetry in here. Uh, in Job chapter one, we have this uh, setup where Satan comes 
before God, this adversary comes before God and uh, God brings up Job. And, and so Job goes through this time period of testing. He loses, he loses all of his financial wealth and he loses his children. They all die in a tragic accident. And it's, it's actually, it's God who brings up Job. Um, Job is, uh, is a good man. He is, uh, you know, he's learned how to shun evil and he's learned how to seek good. And it's God. He says, Satan, have you seen my servant Job? And I think that we need to remember that in this particular passage. Go ahead, Corey. Right. Yeah. So in chapter one, he loses his wealth and his children. And then in chapter two, uh, he still hasn't abandoned God. And so then he loses his physical health and essentially his wife's support because she just can't take it anymore. At this point, she's devastated um, and, and she loses this support or she stops supporting Job in his desire to just speak with God about this. Job's friends come and they're so overcome that they just sit with him for seven days. Uh, in chapter three, Three, Job begins his lament uh, about everything that's happening to him. In chapter four, we have the first of his friends, Eliphaz, begin to speak. And essentially, he, he brings an accusation against Job. And he says, you know, why are you faltering now? You, you, with your words, you've supported people who have come into hard times. And now you come into hard times and you're faltering. Stay strong. If you're truly righteous, it's going to be okay. Just appeal to God. And, and you know what? Don't despise God's correction, Job. And then, so that's in chapters four and five. And then in chapters six and seven, Job replies to Eliphaz and he's quite offended. Essentially, he says, you don't get it. I have no hope. What can I hope for? God's taken everything from me, including my children. How can he fix that? How can he bring it back? And in six, verse 26, Job says uh, something that I think is really interesting. He says, do you mean to correct what I say and treat my desperate words as wind? You even cast lots for the fatherless. You would barter away your friend. Essentially, Job's going, I'm just desperate. I'm desperate and I want to hear from God. And, and you're accusing me of stuff? What, what, what kind of friend are you? And then Job uh, also, he, he, he says these things like, would I lie to you right now? Look at me. And then he, Job turns his words to God and he says, God, what have I done to you? Why me? Have I become a burden to you? Why won't you just forgive me? What is it about me? Just kill me if you hate me. Why do you have to devastate me? So this is the chapter six and chapter seven. It's really showing us Job's mindset and where he's at in loss. And I think that's a tremendously, he's tremendously relatable in chapter six and cha chapter seven. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's important for us to remember that uh, the whole story is set in the context of God is the one who brought up Job and God is the one he's twice. Uh, Satan goes and, uh, to God and God says, have you seen my servant Job? And uh, he says, yeah, but you, you've, you've done everything and you protected him. So of course he's going to serve you. God says, take it away, but you know, just take it away. And then he comes back, Satan a second time. And he says, where have you been to and fro on the earth? And he says, yeah, have you seen my servant Job? Brings him up again. And Satan says, yeah, but if you touch the man physically, then that's it. And this is kind of where we're at in the world today. If you touch the man physically, if you touch the people physically with the COVID virus and all of that. See, God wasn't causing this, but God allowed it to happen. And this is the thing that we need to understand is that God allows this, these things to go forward because he respects our free will decisions. He doesn't, doesn't cause this. But there's a lot of people today who really feel that uh, they, they need help. And let me tell you something we do in the case of this COVID-19 uh, coming up and dealing with this. And I wanna pray for all of the people who are struggling and with that, you know, I've got a lot of friends, I've got people who've had this. And uh, I, I need to tell you that uh, God heals and God helps, but even so, regardless of what happens, like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, when they were cast into the fire because they did not worship Nebuchadnezzar's idol, the second commandment says, don't worship idols. He, he says, you know, they, they say, listen, we're going to be, we're not going to worship your idol and you may kill us and we may die, but you're not going to worship your idol. And what happens is they go into the fire and the fire does not destroy them because one like the son of God is in there. And that's something that we need to remember. We need to pray for the people around the world who have dealt with this COVID-19 global virus problem. 
And we need to pray that God would help us to recover and God would help us to remember what we've learned during this time. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would help us to know and to learn what it is that you want us to learn. And Father, we come back to you and we ask for your forgiveness. We ask, Lord, that you would help us. Lord, we understand that you did not do this. But Father, your provision, your help is beyond anything. And so, Lord, even when we don't have medication, we come to you and give ourselves to you. You help us and you heal us and you touch us. Heal the people who have suffered and heal the people who have passed away. Be with them and touch them, Lord, and, and help them. And may every person understand that it's through Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, that you are a Christian. You are somebody who follows God. So here's how you do that, beloved. I want to share this with you. You pray. Praying is talking to God. And you say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I need you now. Help me be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Very important. Rod, just like in that, that account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was Nebuchadnezzar who had put them in that fiery furnace. And it was he that said, we put three men in, I see four, and that fourth looks like the Son of God. And may this, everything that happens in our world, may the glory of God be seen by those who don't know him.